Imaging and Interventions in Renal Artery Stenosis In a general hypertensive population, a renal artery stenosis would be seen in 1 to 5 percent of the patient. It is seen in 25 percent of the patients who have routine coronary angiography. It is seen in 50 percent of the patients who have peripheral angiography and 16 to 20 percent of the patients who are undergoing renal dialysis. Now we know that the two common diseases is atherosclerosis and fibromuscular dysplasia. Atherosclerosis is normally seen in the older age group. It's more common in men. It affects smokers. You will generally see evidence of atherosclerosis in other vessels. These patients present with hypertension which are resistant to treatment and they are often associated with renal impairment. On angiography, they are mostly osteal or in the proximal third. There may be non osteal lesions in 15 to 20 percent. They may rarely be seen in the distal third in 5 percent of the patients. They tend to be bilateral in 50 percent of the patients. On the other hand, Fibromuscular dysplasia is seen in the young. M most of the time they are women. Their presence as hypertension are not renal failure. And they are not associated with peripheral vascular disease involving other vessels. The other causes of renal artery stenosis can be neurofibromatosis, tachyosis, arthritis, and congenital stenosis where the child presents with hypertension at birth. When do you suspect renal artery stenosis? When a patient has refractory or accelerated hypertension, hypertension with occlusive peripheral vascular disease and severe hypertension in the young. When you suddenly see a patient of hypertension developing renal failure, when you find there is an increase in serum creatinine following AC inhibitors which you may have given to the patient for endothelial protection, when you see a unilaterally small kidney and flash pulmonary edema would present with sudden pulmonary edema where the LV function is normal. Because a large proportion of patients are treated through an endovascular procedure, a valid diagnostic test need to be done when you have a clinical clue towards renal hypertension. So we have CT angiography, MR angiography, ultrasonography, captopral renal scintigraphy and IVP. IVP is no longer popular and it's years since we've seen anyone doing it. However, at least historically we must remember that contrast was given and films taken at 1, 3, 5, 15 and 20 minutes. The 1 minute film should show the, the delay in excretion and uh, delay in the nephrogram when compared to the normal side. It also helped us to see the size of the kidneys. And uh, today, like we said, we hardly do such a procedure. Doppler ultrasound is still used as a screening tool. You can study by evaluating the renal artery directly and the site of stenosis, but at times when the window is not good, you will have to rely on the indirect method. The renal artery to aortic peak systolic velocity ratio is 3.5.
So if this goes above that, you would suspect a stenosis. The peak systolic velocity is should not go more than 200 centimeters and one should not see any turbulence in, in, all along the renal artery. When a patient has an end diastolic velocity of more than 150 centimeters, then the patient has 80% stenosis of the renal artery. When an RI is 0.9, one would expect the patient to have normal renal vascularity. An occluded renal artery demonstrates no flow in the affected vessel. The length of the kidney is measured. The normal kidney measures from 8.5 to 13 centimeters along the long axis. A difference of more than 2 centimeters in length is always suggestive of underlying occlusion of the renal artery. The normal parenchymal thickness should be 1 centimeter. If it is less than that, this is suspicious of underlying renal artery stenosis. The parenchymal surface should be smooth and if it is not, one should suspect stenosis resulting in multiple infarcts. Once we do a Doppler, the entire length of the main renal artery should be assessed. The reason being that although stenosis is normally seen the proximal third, we know that in fibromuscular dysplasia, this can be the middle and distal third. Once we find the highest velocity, this velocity and the aortic velocity should be measured and the ratio taken. So this is a diagram that would show the normal pattern is seen on the left side. The raised peak systolic velocity is seen on the right side and the pattern that is seen beyond the stenosis is also demonstrated where one would show a very slow rise in the peak systolic velocity and the turbulence that will be seen beyond it. So this is what a normal renal artery Doppler would look like and this is what is expected in renal artery stenosis, the prolonged acceleration time and the, uh, the broadening of the spectrum and the decreased systolic velocity. CT angiography represents a reliable non-invasive screening examination for the detection of renal artery stenosis. We can do an MIP, we can do a multiplanar reconstruction and a VR. All three are necessary to finally come to a conclusion. CT angiography today is found to be accurate in close to 99% of the cases and this I believe is the way to go about evaluating renal artery stenosis if the renal function is normal. These are some pictures of what we get on a 64 slide CT today. As you can see, the quality is outstanding. MR angiography with and without contrast is also an excellent screening tool for the evaluation of renal artery stenosis. With contrast, the accuracy goes up to 100%, but it is good for the evaluation of renal artery osteal lesions and not for lesions which are distal or within the renal parenchyma. Another extremely accurate way to study renal artery stenosis is doing a scintigraphy after giving an AC inhibitor. Like seen over here, one will find derayed excretion on the side where there is renal artery stenosis. On the other hand, if the patient has bilateral renal artery stenosis, this study becomes more difficult to interpret. Even today, even with CT angiography, finally, uh, DSA is the gold standard, though today one would not use it to diagnose renal artery stenosis. But the problem also is that since there is contrast given, it's not the modality of choice when there is renal impairment. Carbon dioxide angiography, on the other hand, is the safest way to angiographically evaluate the renal arteries when the renal function is impaired.